All right, welcome back. This is Patents 3, Part 2, and we're in the textbook at pages 804 to, and 823 to 29. Um, this is actually the last capsule for this week. There's only going to be two, um, not three as we've had for most, um, for most prior weeks. So we're going to look um, in this capsule at two issues. Um, the first one is infringement. So you'll recall in other areas of intellectual property that I said that we won't look at, at infringement in great detail, right? So basically, we will look at what it is that people do that infringes upon the rights of the patent holder. So which actions can someone else do that count as, as essentially patent infringement or copyright infringement or any of the other areas of intellectual property that we looked at, right? But we won't look at the more you know, technical issue of how we measure damages for that. So how that person actually goes to court, does the math as to how much money they're owed for that mischievous action, and then how they eventually get paid. So we look at what constitutes infringement, but we don't really look at remedies or damages in great detail, and that's not gonna change um, in, for patents um, either. So the first thing that we should recall um, is that for patents, it's somewhat broad what it is um, that someone can do that constitutes infringement. So under section 27 of the Patent Act, which I mentioned in the previous capsule, we have a definition of the exclusive rights of the patent holder that is somewhat broad. And so as I said, unlike copyright, which would cover someone basically copying your thing, maybe your text or your art or you know, whatever it is. In the case of patents, we have a protection that's broader. So you're not just protected for someone, say, making your invention. You're also protected from someone making something substantially similar, so copying your invention. You're also protected from someone using your manufacturing process to make something else that is similar to your invention, assuming you have a patent over the process. And so what we're trying to avoid is to have people do things that are substantially similar, right? yet that infringe upon your exclusive right to be the only person that can sell and market your invention for 20 years. Not only do we not want people to make some you know, copies of your invention, we also don't want people to make something very similar that would obfuscate your commercial monopoly over your invention. In that way, it's similar to registered trademarks. So we said under registered trademarks, right, there isn't like copyright a simple way to see what constitutes copying, right? You don't have to, there's no way for you to, to see whether someone copied a substantial part of the text verbatim or not. In the case of trademarks, we have this concept of confusion, which like um, section 27 in patents, tries to cover things um, more broadly. So it tries to cover a broader scope of actions. So essentially your trademark, as we said, right, it's not just a matter of someone copying, say, your logo. Because a person can change a million things about your logo, right, that would still have the same effect, would still confuse customers and, you know, mislead customers into buying their products instead of yours as a person who has a trademark. So we have this concept of confusion which covers all these millions of ways that you can change something um, in a way that still confuses customers. So maybe changing the spelling, maybe removing a letter, maybe changing you know, a couple syllables, maybe changing a color on the logo or some you know, minor aspect of the, of the visual presentation of the logo. And the breadth of protection for patents is somewhat similar to trademarks. At least it's more similar to trademarks than it is to copyright. And you have um, something pretty obvious that's mentioned. Um, as well at page 804, and that is that you have to prove that you have a patent. And oftentimes when it's registered, right, that won't be a problem because the registration is going to be prima facie evidence that you do, in fact, have a patent. Oftentimes, as we'll see though, the person, the defendant, right, um, the, the person that you are suing for having used your um, exclude the thing you have an exclusive right over, is going to allege that your patent and the reason they're going to do that, of course, right, is to prevent, uh, to prevent you from being able to recover from them. 
Quite importantly though, as we said, right, there's an important distinction between regimes where registration is mandatory and regimes where registration is not mandatory, right? And so if the defendant alleges that you don't have a valid patent, right, which they're allowed to do, even if it's registered, there's a presumption when it's registered that it is valid. That doesn't mean that the presumption is not what we call rebuttable, as we said, right? And so you're, that person's allowed to allege that your patent is invalid. Registration basically means that they will have to prove that, not you, right? You won't have to prove it's valid, they'll have to prove it's invalid, but that doesn't mean that registration is a bar to someone alleging that your patent is not valid. As we said in prior you know, types of intellectual property, this is not conceptually correct though, right? It's not really a defense to infringement because of course, if you don't have a patent, you don't have a right at all. So it's not really a matter of someone saying, I haven't infringed upon your right, right, which is infringement, and then saying, I have a good reason. Either I have not infringed upon it, or I did, and I have a good reason. Conceptually, we're not there in the analysis. We're one step earlier, we're saying, it cannot be infringement because you don't have a right at all. So it's not a matter of assessing whether the person did something forbidden, or whether they did something forbidden and have a good excuse. In fact, you know, they cannot do anything forbidden because you don't have an exclusive right to anything. As we saw in copyright, right, and in unregistered trademarks, of course, it is a, a preliminary step where registration is not mandatory for you to prove that you do have a right. So in the cases, in, case, in, in the case of, of um, copyright and unregistered trademarks, there is no registry that says you do have a copyright or an unregistered trademark, at least if you haven't voluntarily registered it. So therefore, when you go to court and try to sue someone for having infringed upon your copyright or your unregistered trademark, the first step is going to be to prove that you do in fact have that right because there's no presumption that arises out of registration. So first you have to prove you have a right, and then second you have to prove that the person has violated that right. It's not the case for patent because registration creates a presumption of validity. And so if you want to sue someone for having done something that is forbidden, there's only one step and that is showing that they violated your patent. You don't have to show that you have a patent in the first place because there's a presumption that it's valid because it's been registered. And therefore, it's for the person on the other side, the person you're suing in that case, to show that your patent is invalid. The burden is on them, unlike was the case for copyright and unregistered trademark. They have to show it's invalid, right? As opposed to you having to show that it is valid. Now, the second section, right, you'll see I, I put the stuff on the board um, magically, it just appeared after five minutes in the video, um, is defenses to infringement, right? As we said, the first defense, which conceptually is not really a defense, is to say that you don't have a valid patent in the first place. That's provided for in section 59. That's what section 59 says. Then you're, you're mentioned this thing called a counterclaim, which you don't have to worry about because it's complex and not particularly uh, relevant for our purposes. Then section 55 creates an exception. So what section 55 does, right, is section 55 says you can use a protected invention to come up with your own thing. As the book says, that's not exactly true, and in fact, it's not true, right? But we're simplifying things here. It's not a blanket exception, doesn't always apply, but for our purposes, there is basically an exception, whether we call it that or not, that says that you can use a protected invention to come up with your own. So recall the example I gave you of the three-legged chair, right? So the three-legged chair, right, is an invention that someone had a patent over a long time ago. Since then, anyone can make a three-legged chair because the patent's expired. The 20 years gone is done, right? Then someone came up with a four-legged chair, right? And they're allowed to do that, right? 
In fact, the, their invention, the four-legged chair in itself, is going to be a protected invention, and at the time it was, right? If the three-legged chair meets the criteria that we looked at, novelty, usefulness, and non-obviousness, right? The, the four-legged chair might very well actually meet these conditions as well. And so you can get a patent on the four-legged chair. What you get a patent over, however, is what you have actually invented, and that is the addition of the leg. It's not the underlying concept of the three-legged chair, right? Not the concept, the invention, sorry. Um, because the concept's never protected, as we said, right? So it's not the three-legged chair, it's the four-legged chair. And therefore, what happens is you only have a patent over the improvement, and that's the only thing you have an exclusive right over. And so you can't prevent the three-legged chair manufacturer from selling their chair, right? And you can't make money from that either. What you make money from, what you have an exclusive right over, is the improvement, the addition of the leg. And so what happens is you might very well have to pay the underlying inventor of the three-legged chair. And so to make a final product that you can sell, you might have to compensate the three-legged chair patent owner, right, because their invention is part of yours. And that's allowed, right? Because the underlying policy reason, of course, is that we don't want people to wait for 20 years. We don't want to in, in, innovation to happen once every 20 years. We want invention to happen continually, and we want people to come up with better improved versions of things. Again, not copies, because that's forbidden, right? Or not anything similar to a copy, because that's also forbidden. But we want people to improve upon inventions before the 20 year period of the patent has expired. And so we have this exception in section um, 55 that says basically for experimentation you can do that. Another example is an iPad, right? An iPad has all sorts of things in there that might have a patent on it, right? You might have a microchip or a screen, for instance, that someone else has a patent over. So the only way you're allowed to put that chip or that screen in your iPad is by paying the patent holder. Again, they're the only person who can make it. And so you have to buy it from them and pay them for that, right? It doesn't mean you don't get a patent over the iPad. In fact, most complex technological inventions today are made up of component parts that the company who invented the thing does not and cannot own. And that's fine. You can still have a patent over your iPad, right? It can be a, a very lucrative patent, but it doesn't give you a right over the component parts. And it doesn't bar you from having a patent over something that uses these patented component parts either. Then at section 55.1 we have what we call prescription. Prescription is you do have a right to do what you're trying to sue for, right? But we won't let you exercise it, right? It happens for generally all rights under the law. And so if you lend someone money and there's a contract that says they have to pay you back, right? And then they don't pay you back. Well, you can go to court and sue. And then you'll be able to come into their home and take their furniture to get paid back. Basically, you'll be able to, you know, execute your judgment, which means, which means force them to pay you back, right? Subject to various limitations in the law that prevent you from doing things that would, um, you know, offend other people's dignity, right? But you can force people to execute their obligation. Then there's another provision that says, but you can only do that three years after it happens. And so even though you do have a right to get paid back on the, under the contract, right? After three years, we don't let you sue anymore. And that's been a problem for sexual assault recently, right? Statutes of limitations, you've heard of that, right? Essentially what that means is you might be correct that someone has you know, committed sexual assault, but we don't let you sue because it's been too long, right? And for instance, in Quebec recently, um, the period for suing for sexual assault was extended to 30 years, which is a lot more than three, right? The underlying rationale for that, for having limitations, is generally that it's hard for people to prove anything. And so the person who did pay you back, and so you're suing them, again, same example, they haven't paid you back, right? You sue them. 
other person might have proof that they in fact did pay you back, that your lawsuit is unfounded. But if it's been seven years, they might just not have the documentation for that. And of course, the way someone proves something in court is with evidence, right? With documents, right? And generally your bank statements are going to be more, um, you know, convincing evidence than you testimonially saying, I did pay the guy back, right? But you probably don't have your bank statements from seven years ago because people don't keep their bank statements for seven years. And therefore, you have a problem in defending yourself against the lawsuit because you no longer have the means to do that because, you know, it's been too long. That's what prescription does, right? And what is prescription for patents? It is under Section 5501, six years. So basically, someone can do something that violates your patent, right? Use the thing, make the thing, whatever it is. You only have six years from the moment they've done the evil thing to sue. After that, you lose your right. You might be correct that someone's infringed upon your rights, but we don't let you sue because it's been too long. Then we have this doctrine that we discussed earlier called exhaustion, right? Exhaustion basically says um, that we will assume that um, we'll assume that people who buy something basically get the rights that we typically would expect from buying the thing, right? So generally, when you buy something, when you buy a protected invention, right, we assume that you buy a bunch of rights. If you buy a snowmobile, we assume that you buy the right to use it, but there might be more. You might also assume that you have the right to take it apart, turn it into a dining table, even though that's not its intended use. In fact, generally, when you buy a thing, it's assumed that you have dominion over it and that you can do pretty much anything you want with it, right? And the way you've acquired that right, of course, is by buying it, right? By compensating the patent holder. What exhaustion says basically is you will have those rights. Exhaustion is you'll have a lot of rights that we typically assume you would have in these circumstances. The typical things that someone should do when they buy something will assume that you can do. Other things we won't. And therefore, we won't assume that you have the right to make copies of it and then sell them because that wouldn't be covered over exhaustion because it's not a thing that we would typically expect people to do, right? when they buy something. It's not really what you're paying for. And on top of that, as we said, the underlying rationale always being the commercial interests of the patent holder, it threatens their commercial interests, right? They've sold you the right to use or to, you know, have it do anything with it for your personal use, right? For your, your personal, um, you know, in, in your personal interest, right? Then if you start selling it, A, it's not what you've paid for and B, it threatens the right of the patent holder because then you'll sell it to say two people who then won't buy it from the patent holder and therefore you'll basically steal money from the patent holder. And that was the issue um, as we said in the, um, in the Monsanto case. Then we have section 65 and 66. They're the nuclear bomb of the Patent Act, right? It's a government coming in and doing things that you don't want the government to do as the patent holder. Section 65 says the government can grant a compulsory license for abuse. It's abuse. So abuse of your rights under the Patent Act. And so you'll recall earlier, right, that I said that generally the way it happens is you have an exclusive right to make your invention. And the way you use that right is by charging people money, right? Generally, the fact that you have an exclusive right to make your invention doesn't mean that you'll prevent other people from making it or from using it. It generally just means that you'll let other people do that in exchange for money. In fact, generally, your interest when you have a monopoly is to sell as much of it as possible because then you make more money from your invention, right? However, that does not directly flow from the concept of a monopoly. As I said, the monopoly is this, you're the only person who can sell it. Well, by virtue of that, right, you're also the only person who can not sell it, right? Generally, when you have a right, you also have a right not to exercise it, right? If you have a right to get paid back by someone, you also have a right not to get paid back, right? To say, well, I won't sue you for the money. You have a right not to exercise your rights. 
In fact, it arises from the very nature of you having a right. You can choose whether to exercise it or not. Well, under the Patents Act, right, you could do that. It wouldn't be very lucrative, but you could decide not to sell your invention to anyone. Right? Of course, that's a problem for a lot of reasons, right? The first reason it's a problem is because of the way we conceive of innovation. The way we conceive of innovation is people coming up with their own stuff, right? So there's two reasons to the Patents Act, right? First, we want people to have access to your invention. That's the bargain of the patent. The bargain of the patent is tell us and you'll make a lot of money, right? We don't want people to keep their inventions secret because they're worried someone's going to steal it from them or some competitor is going to make a copy and then run them into the ground and, you know, drive them bankrupt because they're a less, you know, rich uh, market actor. And so the Patent Act says we will give you an exclusive right such that you don't have to worry about that. On top of that, you'll make a lot of money, even more money than you would have if you had competitors. In exchange for that, you will tell us what your invention is. Well, again, though, right, the reason we want you to tell us what your invention is also involves the fact that we want to be able to use it, not just know about it, because it's not much use if it's written down in the patent registry that your invention exists, right? It doesn't help people have access to it in their living room or in their life, right? And we want people to have that, right? In fact, an invention has to be, as we said, novel and useful. So ostensibly, it makes people's lives better and drives society forward. So we want you to sell it. The other reason we want you to sell it or, or for, we want people to have access to it is, again, as I said, we want people to use it to come up with their own stuff, right? We want people to be able to improve it, and that's how society moves forward. As the Supreme Court said in the Harvard Mouth the Santi thing, right, standing on the shoulders of giants, making use of existing art to make new inventions. And so, Section 65 reflects that objective. Section 65 says if there's abuse, and abuse is you not selling your thing, the government can grant a compulsory license. So basically the government can force you to sell it, or even worse for you, right, can let someone use your thing for free. That's even worse, right, because not only are you forced to provide it, on top of that you don't get paid. Another thing, right, you're given a, a bunch of situations under Section 65 too. it's A through F I think, right? Another thing you can do, of course, is not sell it to a select group of people. So you might say, I don't want to sell my invention to people of a certain religion. And that's clearly religious discrimination, but you might not be able to sue for religious discrimination because um, the charter doesn't apply to private actors generally, right? Other things might apply, but the charter doesn't. That's something we want to prevent because it's discrimination. So that's another way that you will exercise your right not to sell something that the government doesn't want and the government wants to, you know, guard against. And therefore, Section 65 also covers that. The government can force you to sell it to not just everyone can force you to sell it to a group of people you don't want to sell it to. Section 66 is even worse. Section 66 is, we'll cancel your patent, right? So if Section 65 doesn't work, if we can't get you to, if we can't get a compulsory license, basically if we can't solve the problem, which is access to your invention, with Section 65, we'll cancel your patent, right? That's really bad. Because then you don't make any money at all. And someone else does in your stead. That's what would have happened conceptually 20 years from now. If you're protected for 20 years, right, you have an exclusive right to make your invention for 20 years. Then what happens after 20 years, you don't. So someone else can copy it, anyone, and sell it for cheaper. Of course, what's generally going to happen is that within the 20 years, you're going to have built an inherent competitive advantage such that you'll have an edge over your competitors, even if it's not by virtue of your legal monopoly. So over the 20 years, right, because you're the only person in the marketplace, you will have made a lot of money. That's a competitive advantage. On top of that, you'll have built your reputation because if, if you're the only person that can sell it, right, people develop this idea that the only person who makes snowmobiles and snowmobiles are great is Phil. 
and therefore, right, still has a tremendous reputation as a maker of snowmobiles. Then if someone else starts a snowmobile company, people are still gonna wanna buy it from Phil. And therefore, when your patent expires, right, you might still have an edge over your competitors. But after the 20 years, anyone can make it, you're no longer protected, you can have competitors. Section 66 says the government can cancel your patent. What does that do? Well, functionally what it does is it, you know, makes that happen earlier. The thing that would have happened 20 years from now, which is you losing your monopoly, happens earlier. Therefore, patent is canceled, right? And anyone can make it, and as a result, you don't make any money, right? Or at least you only make money from the people you sell it to with competitors, which is the worst thing for you. And that's something the government can do, canceling your patent. Again, subject to Section 65. Only when the compulsory license thing doesn't work can the government cancel your patent because of what we just defined as abuse. Then we have this issue of jurisdiction. So we discussed that earlier, so we won't go over it in great depth again, right? But generally, the federal court can do anything having to do with patents. Federal court, as we said, is a limited jurisdiction, unless, unlike the provincial superior courts, which are the courts of general jurisdiction, right? The federal court can only do what the government said it can do, and one of these things is intellectual property. And therefore, any problem you have with intellectual property, you can go to the federal court for. As we said though, the federal court might not be the only place that you can go. Right? So you might still go to the provincial superior courts as well, depending on how you choose. And generally the distinction is gonna be, and again, as I said, that's making it much, much simpler than it really is. But the distinction is going to be, right, whether you're suing for infringement or validity. If you're suing for infringement, if you're saying someone violated my patent, right, and you want money because that's the compensation you get in court, right, well then, you can go to the provincial superior courts as well. As we said, you might, want, you might prefer going to the federal court. One of the reasons for that is that it's a federal court, and so the judgment you get has effect all across Canada. If you get a judgment from the Quebec Superior Court, right, then you want to force execution. You want to go into the defendant and take their furniture to pay yourself, right? Well, you can't do that outside of Quebec. You can't go to Alberta, if that's where their assets are, and take their stuff. You will first have to go to the Alberta Superior Court and show a bunch of things generally that you could have gotten the same judgment under Alberta law. It's not true of the federal court because it's a federal court. And so generally people still prefer to go to the federal court. Even if you know that the company has the assets in the same province you're suing, because the federal court also has, you know, expertise in that matter, right? Because it's one of the few things that the federal court does. And therefore, right, you might think that the federal court is less likely to get it wrong. However, as we said, it's only true for infringement. For validity, generally, the federal court may have exclusive jurisdiction. So if, you want, if what you want to do is not say, I want money because someone did something wrong with my patent and stuff, right? If what you say is the patent is not valid, as we saw under Section 52, for instance, there is exclusive jurisdiction of the federal court. The only place you can go is the federal court, right? And the um, Section 52 says, right, as we said, the Attorney General or any interested person can ask for the patent to be voided. So again, either because the examiner did the examination wrong or because they didn't do the examination at all. As we said, examination is not mandatory. And then you might, you know, wake up one day and say, wow, this person got a patent, but they shouldn't have because they never met the conditions. Then you want the patent voided. You want it canceled because it's not legit. Anyone can do that. The Attorney General of, of Canada, which is the government, right? Generally, the Attorney General of Canada represents all the federal agencies, right? So 
when you see versus Attorney General of Canada, it's all of the federal agencies um, whose name is substituted for the Attorney General in um, court proceedings. So the government or any other person can go to the federal court to have the patent voided. And that, again, that's exclusive jurisdiction. Then we have another regime that you mentioned, not so important, pages 826 and following, for drugs, right? So as we said, right, drugs are molecules that do something. And that was one of the arguments, you'll recall, in the descent to the Harvard Mouse case, right? One of the arguments of the majority was, if we let you patent life, it's going to be free for all, society's going to fall apart, and then we'll just bite our nails until they bleed, right? Well, right, the dissent said, that's not so true. If we let you patent something, that doesn't mean that you can do anything, right? By virtue of the Patent Act, you might. The Patent Act only says it is patentable. So you have to meet the conditions, then you can get a patent. The dissent stresses in the Harvard Mouse case that doesn't prevent the government from having other conditions. So another law that says, you know, there's further conditions. So for you to get your patent, well then you can't sell it unless you do certain things. Or you cannot continue to sell it unless you do certain things. For instance, in drugs, right, we'll want you to prove that it's safe and efficacious, right? It's wor it works and doesn't hurt people. And that's going to be a prerequisite to selling it. And so by virtue of the Patent Act, right, you have the exclusive right to sell your thing, your drug. That doesn't mean that you can actually sell it without meeting the requirements of other laws. In the case of drugs, it's what we call the food and drug regulations. Food and drug, the things you put in your mouth, right, and generally we want to make sure that it is what it, you're saying it is, it does what you're saying it does, and it's not dangerous. And that's what the food and drug regulations are there for. Again, even though you have something that you can get a patent on, or do get a patent on, you still have to meet these various, con these, the, the, the conditions under you know, laws or regulations that are enacted um, for your specific industry. One of the things that we have, right, is what we call the Notice of Compliance Mechanism, which we presented very briefly. That's in the Food and Drug Regulations, right? There's, what, what we said is that, again, a drug is a molecule that does something. The reason you get a patent is because, not necessarily you invented the molecule, but you found out that the molecule does something. In fact, you might not even have found out. You might just have proven it, right? People might have suspected that the drug worked, right? Or they might have proved that in Finland, for instance. But then you're the one that buys a million rats, right? Does clinical trials for millions of dollars and then proves definitively that it works. And then you have an exclusive right to sell it for 20 years, right? Well, that right's only for 20 years. After that, we can have what we call a generic, which is the exact same molecule with some other name on it. And there's exceptions under the mechanism, on, under the, the food and drug regulations, basically for um, your competitors to come in before the 20 years expired, right, and get the right to sell the generic when the 20 years does finish, right? And quite importantly, right, in the case of, um, of generics um, specifically, oftentimes what they'll do is a comparison, right? So, Basically, your studies, right, the rats we talked about, your studies are yours. And so someone cannot use them to, to get approval for their own drug, unless, of course, it's a generic that's no longer protected or won't be. And so under the, the regulations, they can make a comparison. They can use your studies to say, it's the exact same thing. We won't kill you know, a million rats again because um, it's not really necessary because it's the exact same thing with another name, which we can now sell because it's been 20 years. You also have the patented medicine board, right, which basically can fix a price. Only place in the economy, really, where the government can put a price on something, can force the private sector to sell it for something. And that is um, a demonstration of things that we've discussed before. And that is that when you have a monopoly, you make a lot of money. Because there are two limits to how much money you can make from your product. The first one is what people are willing to pay, right? You can charge whatever you want, but it won't, at some point people just won't buy it because they won't think it's worth what you're charging for it. 
The other limit is your competitors. And so you might try to sell it for however much money, but then your competitor will sell a, a cheaper version and drive you out of business. But when you have a monopoly, you don't have competitors. And so you can sell it generally for more money than you otherwise would because your only limit is what the market will bear, what the customers will pay. And of course, that's a problem in the case of drugs because, you know, that might mean that people won't have access to drugs because they cost too much money. On top of that, we have a thing called the agency problem. And that's, that happens in business. Essentially, when the person making the decision is different from the person bearing the consequences of the decision. In other words, it might be, and it generally is, much easier for you to spend someone else's money than spending your own. You don't have the same attachment to someone else's money than you do to your own, right? It's an agency problem. Basically, when people are not as, um, you know, thrifty as they would otherwise be because they're not spending their own money. That's true in the case of drugs, right? So, in fact, you might not be selling your pill for a customer, to a customer. You might be selling your pill to a pharmacist or to a, a, an insurer, right? And that person's paying, not the customer. And therefore, the customer doesn't exert price pressure on you because it's not their own money. And that compounds the problem of your monopoly. That compounds the problem of you charging too much money because it's whatever the market will bear. In fact, it's even worse than if you had price pressure. There's other things about healthcare, of course, um, that make that even worse, arising from the fact generally that when people need a life-saving drug, they don't have negotiating power. Right? either because there's no competitors or because they will die if they don't get the medicine they need. And therefore, we have the Patent and Medicine Board, which can, which can regulate the prices of medicines. The other thing that you mentioned very briefly at page 828 is access in developed countries. That's something we talked about already. We said that generally innovation happens in wealthier countries. Probably it shouldn't be the case, but nonetheless it is what happens, right? Because generally, the money and the, the, the people with doctorates are in developed countries. And as a result, that means that there's a lot of money being made in developed countries. When you make an invention, right, you'll want to sell it around the world. And you can do that. Of course, you'll have to get approval in all the countries you want to sell it in. But nonetheless, you remain a Canadian company making money all over the world. You're sucking money out of developing countries into developed countries. It's a structural problem from the very nature of intellectual property and you having a monopoly because then you, can, you can't have right, an African company as your competitors because you have a monopoly. In the case of drugs, right, it's even worse because what might happen is right, the company will sell the drug for a bit cheaper in developed countries but not much. And therefore, the, the people won't have access to the drug because the cost of living might be much lower, but the price of the drug isn't. And we saw that for the COVID vaccine. I think it was Pfizer that said they'll sell it for 40 bucks wherever they are, right? Well, 40 bucks is a lot more money in African countries, especially if the state's covering it, than it is in developed countries. On top of that, right, if you only had the African country, Pfizer might still have been willing to develop the vaccine. Say it costs them $3, right? It's probably around the reality, right? Say it costs them $3 in research and development to come up with the vaccine, now they sell it for 40. Well, they might have sold it for 10 or 20 because, you know, it's still a three to 700% profit, which kind of makes it worth it, right? Makes it worth the risk of, inve of investing in research and development. But then it happened in the developed countries and so they sell it for 40 bucks. And so the developed country, the developing countries might not even have access to something that would otherwise have been developed at a cheaper price. 